everybody, welcome to this is an extra slice here on uh, a hot day in July with me, Nick. I'm doing Ch Ephesians chapter 6, 20 onwards today, 10 onwards today, following on from the sermon just last week on the, ser on the sermon, uh, not sermon series this time, just a bit of a one-off as we were in between series. We'll go a little bit deeper into the passage. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you haven't been to these before, where have you been before? It's lovely to have you. If you're in a home group, welcome everybody. A little way for you if you're on your own. If you're using me as a podcast to go to sleep to, it's a little bit rude, but you know, I'll take it. Um, lovely to have you with us. Uh, we're going to go a bit deeper into this passage. I tried the ukulele this week on the key, on the um, on the guitar, the little rhythm I've been uh, doing. It doesn't work as well. Guitars are too slow and ponderous and not as zippy as the ukulele. Those who don't like it, send me in a jingle. We'll use that instead. Uh, I'm looking at you, uh, organists who watch. Uh, I'd love to have a full, full organ version of our little, little jingle at the beginning. Chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, we are, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Now, this um, follows what's called the household codes in, um, in Ephesians, which aren't very popular uh, to talk about these days, but the household codes, so they go through all the categories. You've got uh, marital codes that are there, uh, then about children and parents, and then indeed the relationship of slaves to those who they're working with, uh, and for, uh, and then masters as well, how they should respond. But here it's all inclusive. Finally, all of you uh, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, this passage is one of those that's around spiritual warfare and that kind of aspect, uh, and is one of the favourite passage, passages. If you remember watching this on uh, some time ago, it's actually a passage which is quite contentious in 20th century um, theology and the way it's worked, especially with a man called Walter Wink and his particular interpretations of the language of dominions, uh, authorities, uh, powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil, and the way he's interpreted that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I want to take it principally uh, in its historical context, so to think about what Paul may have meant. Um, and I think we partly want to do that by rooting it in Paul's thought world. So if, you, if you're hearing interpretations of the Bible, um, partly you need to say to yourself as a first and initial question, um, how would the original writer have conceived of this thing that they are writing? How would they have understood it? And if they haven't got those categories, um, that we have today, if they don't think in the same kind of categories, and, and therefore that's what I'm going to, how do I get back to their ideas so that I can get I can, I can get a little bit deeper into their original intention? Now, that's not to say that their original intention of the author completely dominates how we might understand it later and the light that various bits of history expresses on, on questions, which are then illuminated in different ways by the scripture. But we are at least limited by the author's original intention, um, uh, or at least a little bit, even for our most um, modern or postmodern and liberal interpreters. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So this question, um, whenever we're talking about spiritual authority and warfare, um, I'm always a bit nervous, to be honest, because there's a lot of crazy talk. There's a lot of nonsense talk out there about it. Firstly, be strong where? In the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, any time people talk to you about dark forces, about um, wickedness or, or problems in the world, the response of the Christian is always in God, not in myself. It's always in the powers in God and not in myself. And so there's sometimes this language of uh, pu pu puffing oneself up against those things, um, you know, is quite poor. Um, and so what we'll see through this passage is again and again and again, anything that's put on by the Christian, it's not theirs themselves. It's always a gift of God and it comes from God. And a lot of it has connections with quite clearly the work of Christ and what he has done, which we then appropriate for ourselves. And then of course, um, uh, yeah, so that's that's the primary thing there. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Uh, last thing to say before we get into this is that whenever we're talking about battles and language of spiritual battles, and that was part of the um, the talk in certainly the 11 o'clock service which was recorded um, that's there. Uh, the, the, in lots of ways, the war is already won. The war is already won for Christians, that we are confident, not in our own strength, but we're confident in the victory of Christ over the forces of darkness, um, back at the cross principally, that at the cross, 
uh, the forces of darkness are exposed as, as weak. And whilst they tried to destroy the Lord, he only came out on top. And that the victory of the cross is the victory that can be appropriated for Christians. But it's still always God's victory, not ours. If you haven't spent much time with me in the past, I'm always as a vicar, as a minister, as a Christian, the way I want to be shaped is focus more on the Lord than on my own achievements or the achievements of humanity or indeed organisations or structures. That's uh, If that's a fault, which it can be, some theologians have faulted that way. Uh, Karl Barth, one of my heroes, is often faulted in that way for not really seeing the position of humanity in things. Uh, it's a fault I'm willing to risk uh, for the overall benefit of God first, human second. Uh, put on the full armour of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, one of the things that's interesting around uh, the language of the demonic is that in in a lot of the sort of comic book sort of world that we think about and that people are attracted to when we, we think about dark and evil, it's very much um, the language of open battle. So um, good light versus dark in, in, jet, in Star Wars or something like that, or, you know, the, the allied forces against the Nazis, that kind of thing is invoked. However... Most of the time that the, the, the enemy is, is, is pictured in the New Testament, it's more like trickery in that evil rarely looks like evil when it's presenting itself. Um, you, when you're a child, you watch TV and the bad guy has a, a moustache, which they twizzle as they are about to blow up the, the train tracks. People, when they're doing great wickedness, often don't think they are doing wickedness which means that there's a humbling there when we think about evil and darkness and things like that, which is that we are all capable of great evil. We are all capable of great evil. I'm often taken back to um, when they were doing the trials of the Nazis in the Second World War and uh, they were they were parading them out in the in the um, for the, the and a bit of a show trial in lots of ways, you know, it's clearly what they were going to, the result's going to be there. But when they're pictured who these men and women are, they're ordinary bureaucrats in lots of ways. They they look regular and they've ordered these great, greatly evil things against people who, you know, children and then gone home and had tea with their, with their children and their wife and played on the carpet and been a lovely, loving father or, or something like that. But in the daytime have been capable of great evil. And I think that What's happening there is that humans have this great capacity to justify what we're doing to ourselves. We have a great capacity of doing of justifying evil to ourselves, and therefore we we deceive ourselves. We are quite easily deceived, even by ourselves, about what we're really doing. And so that's one of the one of the tools of uh, how am I doing this? Well, partly I'm in a community which which pushes back on me and says, "No, that's not a good way." Uh, that's that's a positive thing. I have a straight line, which is the scriptures that, that, that tell me, you know, this is the good. This is not the not the right way to go. Um, whereas if you're more isolated, it's quite easy to get into a rut of being think, oh, yeah, this is fine. This is absolutely fine. So um, evil is deceptive. And the way it's deceptive is it, it tricks you into thinking that the, the evil is actually good. Um, and that's really common. And we are all, me included, vicars included, uh, very much vicars included, capable of great harm um, by, but not necessarily intending great harm. That's positive, isn't it? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what's he talking about here? Well, I mentioned a man called Walter Wink earlier, who following um, the great structural evils that we saw in the in the 20th century, so principally um, the uh, rise of Nazism and the way that structured people into being horrid, really, really horrid. Uh, but then also um, the great number of people killed under Mao's regimes um, in the in the in the language of um, industrial revolution, the, the cultural revolution, uh, which would leap them forward from an agrarian society to industri industri industrialized people, which caused great starvations amongst millions of people, barely talked about in the West. To Stalin's regimes, where millions of his own people were killed, to I mean the list goes on and on and on. So 
what happened was theologically a lot of Christians in the 20th century responding to that started to talk about evil less impersonal um, partly because they're trying to avoid that mustache twizzling image that I had a minute ago of the devil being a personal evil to say actually there's a structural problem that causes these issues um, so some of them and Walter Wink was really drove um, this analysis was that the powers the authority the rulers the authority against the powers of this dark world are more like sociological structures rather than demonic entities which is how many Christians have traditionally thought of them. Now I think uh, what this isn't a case for Walter and I've talked about this before Walter Wink's analysis is very thick so I've just given you a very brief and probably poor summary of it. It has lots to commend it and it's been very influential and I think it can also be very helpful to think in those forms which is that evil is not um, evil it is but because it's deceptive it comes in ways that look ordinary look simple I was just following orders say the Nazi guards I was just doing what my man my manager said to to me to do even though I felt it was grossly wrong I knew it was grossly wrong in different ways so w Wink is right to say that different things work through these different schemes of great evil and who can deny some of those, those examples of that I described as, as being wicked and evil however if we keep that 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 hermeneutical hermeneutical hermeneutics just means the rules of interpretation hermeneutical rules in our mind that that principally we have to think through um, how the original author is thinking that helps us out to to limit without getting too too fruity <laughs> with our interpretation fruity is probably not the right word and in Paul's mind I don't think the so, the the rather refined sociological analysis that Wink is coming up with is foremost in his mind. Um, I think, so instead, Paul has uh, demonic entities in his head and he has a, an eschatological, that is a future uh, concern about the reality of that. So, um, and I, I'm also gonna put, so in the next chapter, next verse, when the day of evil comes. So there, the, the language of day of evil, the day of judgment, the day of wickedness, the day of tribulation, um, it, it is very much in the, tradi the Jewish apocalyptic tradition of this time when the people of God will, will struggle in some kind of way. And he's not there thinking principally about sociology and communism and white collar crime. He's thinking about angels and demons and lots of other, other bits and pieces along those lines. So that I think is what's going on in his head. And he's trying to remind us and say, look, the, the struggles that we have as Christians are not just against you know you're not just fighting I don't know um, you, you're not just fighting bureaucracy for example you're fighting something real in um, it, it, that, that's wicked that's, that's stopping something good happening I'm trying to think of an example which won't get me into trouble which isn't very easy uh I'm struggling to do it without getting into trouble uh, too much or being too broad. Um, I remember, I'll tell you a story, because it's been fairly heavy so far, 13 minutes, forgive me, friends. I'll tell you a story. When I was about to be ordained, I was walking around um, Glastonbury, um, and we were that's where the retreat centre was, just before I was about to be ordained initially. Um, and I was looking in a lot of the windows as you're going along, and I've always been very sensitive to something, I don't know why, but very sensitive to... Uh, materials, especially the ones that are connected with the occult and things like that. And I, I walked past one of these windows, I was on my own, and I felt the urge to pray about some of these things that I was seeing in the windows in Glastonbury. And because um, I used to get headaches and stuff like that quite often when I passed them, I don't really get that why, but I did. Um, so I was passing, I was about to pray into it, and I just felt the Lord say, and I don't, I don't know, what the Lord say, just you're not ready yet, you're not in a, you're not in a position of strength yet. And so um, some of you will hate on me for saying that, but there's a sense in which, you know, you do need to be prepared for engaging in dark with dark things and not just be like, oh, yeah, I'm just a normal Christian walking down the street, wearing my jeans, chewing my gum, everything's normal already. There is an element of preparation here, which is what Paul's saying. And, and in lots of ways, I was a bit cocky. I was mid 20s. I was, I'd just come out of a, a master's in theology. I was feeling like ready, I was about to be ordained, I was ready, I was ready to go. But no, you're not ready actually. You need you need either some backup, you need to do some more prayer work. You can't just jump into these things uh, straight away. So be wise um, in that. And that's what Paul is saying here. 
put on the full armor of God. It's not just kind of, oh yeah, this is all easily mine. It's something active in that. Um, and we have similar language that Paul's using to putting on the new self that we get in Romans. Um, so sometimes it's like a white robe is, is imaged, but here it's a more, more aggressive armor type situation. Um, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything uh, to stand, in other words, and this word stand is, is quite continuous. Um, it's not here about moving forward. Sometimes we use the language of running the race. Sometimes we use the language of walking in Christ. In John, we've had that walking in the truth. Here, it's just survival. You're just, you're standing up. You're taking it. Um, you're not necessarily fighting it off yourself. Uh, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the talk. Without the truth being there, um, everything else falls down. You're going to get you 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 you're, you're going to be found out with your pants fell down. Uh, Lisa said to me the other day. She said, "Did you say your trousers came down and said, No, I did not say that at all. I said I was worried that they would come down one time because my belt was too loose. So uh, here, the truth is what keeps your trousers up. Uh, it keeps you it keeps you in order. Keeps you be from being exposed in some way that's going to be embarrassing. Keeping things true. Keeping things simple. Keeping things like." That way around. Um, what he, Paul would probably got in mind as well is that this is the truth of the gospel, the truth of what God says about you, keeps you feeling secure, ready to be vigorous rather than shook around uh, by different uh, forces of, of wickedness. Uh, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. We haven't talked about this a lot, I haven't gone through Romans or anything, but you've been in church for longer than five minutes, you should have heard this, that as a Christian, your righteousness is not dependent upon what you've done. Your righteousness is dependent upon who you are in Christ. Your righteous acts, what you things you do, are then an outworking of who you are in Christ, being in Christ uh, by virtue of your baptism. So you are called righteous and that protects you, protects your heart. You know, whatever they say about me, I'm righteous because whatever I do, I'm righteous because of what the Lord done for me rather than because of something by myself that keeps you keeps you strong protects the heart protects you from just uh, being stabbed uh, uh, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace now uh it's a really unusual phrase he doesn't really use this elsewhere it's sometimes uh we have odd sometimes in the new testament and in the bible we have references to other passages which then give us insight into the passage you're reading and so you can go, oh, I can kind of understand he, he's using that and he's twisting it. Sometimes it's a bit unusual. This is an unusual passage and, and the interpretation goes a few uh, different ways. The gospel of peace is what gives you peace because of partly because of what we're seeing later with the helmet of salvation. A sense of who you are in Christ gives you that and, and your freedom in Christ gives you that peace. But the language of gospel of peace means that we are something we are sharing as well. So in the battle, part of what we have is this gospel of peace, which we share out with other people, um, bringing peace rather than dissension, distrust um, and confusion that's happening there. That's the gospel of peace that we're we're ready to go with, with the shoes of peace that's imaged there. Um, I nearly forgot, but we are referencing, I can't believe 18 minutes. Sorry, everybody. I need a water break. I've been talking for 20 minutes. Uh, I nearly forgot, did look this up beforehand. Um, Isaiah 59 is the reference that Paul is using for this image of the armour of God. And there, where the people have failed so far, so much, the leaders, um, the priests, uh, the elders of the city have failed so much, the prophets have failed so much, that God says uh, through Isaiah, I will come myself. And the images he uses, I mean, Paul is quite clearly just quoting, um, he's quite clearly just quoting from Isaiah 59. It's so striking. Uh, that I have to go and find it. Do you know what? Sometimes I'm preparing for these things and I think, oh, I'll just put a bookmark in them. I think, I'll do it on the fine. I'll do it there. And then, yeah, it's never fine. You have to wait two minutes. So there we go. Some lift music for you. There we are. The Lord looked and was displeased and there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked at salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. Here we go. He put on righteousness as his breastplate. A helmet of salvation on his head. Now the bit that Paul doesn't take on, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as with a cloak. Um, 
interesting that Paul doesn't really have the language of the offensive ones, uh, or certainly not vengeance here. Instead, we have a gospel of peace um, that comes from his shoes. But let's keep going. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Uh, from my commentary, I read that they would often uh, ha cover a shield before it was, was tempered with pitch uh, and then, then set fire to it so that when um, fire arrows, fire arrows that are literally on fire, um, would hit, they would literally go out because they, they'd be extinguished by it. You would be prepared for the arrows that were coming your way. Fire is meant to spread anxiety in a time of, you know, wooden things. Um, you know, you've got a, if you've got a group, if you've got a group of soldiers that are all together and some of them are carrying wood, wooden cloth, they're going to get burnt up. There's going to be great panic. Um, as as a church, as a group, as a unit, and I want to bring this forward in the in the sermons especially, you know, there are going to be attacks which feel like we're going to set forward, uh, set this a flame of community. And I think we're seeing that in, in lots of ways. Churches which are very anxious don't do very well. Um, churches which are very anxious about what they, who they are, where they're going to be, whether they're interested, that when there's any kind of attack, um, they, they can't really cope with it. You need that shield of faith, which is that steady uh, process. Now, we trust the Lord in this place. That is not all about us. We trust the Lord and we're going to keep going and step forward. Take the helmet of salvation um, and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Now, um, he's not expo he's not giving much exposition here, but it's quite clear he's taking that language of helmet of salvation um, from, uh, from Isaiah, like we just quoted just a moment ago. And for me, like I said in the sermon, it just represents that peace about you know where you're going um, and there's a stability that comes with that. You keep in your, keep in your cool and keep in your head. Last thing, the only offensive weapon, I remember saying this last time, the only offensive weapon all, amongst all of these is a sword. He just picks a sword, he doesn't pick a pike, or he doesn't pick a, um, he doesn't pick a, 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 a saber, he doesn't pick a great staff or um, a spear or anything like that, a sword. Now probably a, a short sword is probably the sort of imagery he's got in his head, doesn't really matter here for us in lots of ways. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In other words, use your Bible whenever you're encountering dark things use your Bible. Now the enemy can use the Bible as well, we see that in the temptations, so uh, at the temptations of Christ the, the enemy quotes scripture to Jesus but he responds with scripture. Um, we're, when we're engaging in dark things we want to keep on the, on the straight and narrow which is using the words of scripture. Guys if you don't know your Bible why not? Get to know it, get to read it, you've got to know your Bible, it should just come out from you. You don't want to just know your Bible through me. That's not enough. You have got to know your Bible yourself. Why? Because if you're in a fist fight, then you need more than your fists. You need the sword of the spirit, which is going to equip you to defend against the, the works of the enemy. That's enough for one uh, one extra slice. It's 23 minutes. My days, this guy can talk. What do I want you to talk about? Well, what do we make about this whole language of spiritual battle? Do you think I've got it right? Do you think Walter Wink is right in the way I've talked about it there? Do you think uh, those languages of um, power, hostile powers to Christianity, uh, hostile powers are more sociological in nature? Is there a demo demonic quality to them? How would we know? That's your first question. Secondly, I want you to think through a little bit um, about the dec deceitfulness of evil, which is what I want to talk about. Uh, where have you seen that? Um, where have you seen that in yourself? Where have you seen that in others and, and groups you've been part of? Then how do you cope with this? Dif how do you interpret these different uh, aspects of the armour of God? You will have heard a hundred sermons on this because it's one of those passages that gets up and up again. Uh, but how do you interpret the different um, the different aspects, especially that shoes of peace? Because that's a bit of an interesting one. Um, enjoy your conversations. I'd love to uh, let me know if you've enjoyed these. It was always encouraging to keep going. Otherwise, I think, what's that point? And uh, I'll see you very soon. Where's my ukulele? If you don't like the ukulele, remember, send me your jingles. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.